Hello and welcome back to this Davenfield Idealistic Crusade. This video is a review of the Keanu Lorber Blu-ray release of The Strange Love of Martha Ivers from 1946, which was produced by Hal Wallace and directed by Lewis Milestone from a Robert Rawson screenplay. This is an iconic film noir title and unfortunately one that fell into the public domain a long time ago. So while it was an independent Wallace production made for and released by Paramount, it was not renewed in its copyright. So it has been cursed with horrible transfers over the years. And before for this uh, new 4K scan of a uh, surviving fine grain print element, uh, the only release of note was the old Paramount DVD, which unfortunately went out of print pretty quick and went for high dollar amounts. And I only got to rent it years ago, but I've always meant to get, get a copy or hope somebody would do a, a new scan and Blu-ray release. So this is a really welcome title to see from a new scan because it just has been battered around over the years and you can still find horrible uploads of of it on YouTube and elsewhere and many terrible crappy public domain DVDs because it was just not renewed and it fell into that status decades ago. So the first time I saw this film it looked and sounded terrible because I saw some crappy public domain copy and most broadcasts of it on television were usually in poor shape. So it's been a harder film to see a good version of for years. It's just been basically TCM airings, the, the Paramount DVD, and now this Blu-ray release, and also a, a release from Imprint in Australia of the same master. Those those are really the only good options, so don't, don't see this film any other way than these. This is an iconic noir in a lot of ways. It's primarily thought of for the big names attached, and especially on a story standpoint, for the big uh, trio of stars and the sort of strange and odd love triangle that this film is about. While this film is definitely a noir, it's also a bit atypical. We open with an extended prologue sequence of our main characters as young children and how they deal with a particular event that occurs, especially a particular death of a very nasty parental figure played with relish by Judith Anderson, who's always great in everything, but here she gets to play a particularly nasty character and even though she's only in the opening of the film, uh, her influence is felt for the rest of the film because the performance is so strong. But it's the, uh, the this character's demise that then colors the rest of the film because we then have a, a, a jump forward to the present in 1946 when the character of Sam Masterson, played by Van Heflin, comes back as an adult. All these years later, he happens to uh, need a car repaired in the small city of Iverstown, where he grew up. And so he gets to go around the town and see how things have changed and decides for various reasons to look up some old friends, these being the other two children we saw in the opening prologue, uh, especially the character of the title, Martha Ivers, played unforgettably by Barbara Stanwyck. And we get to see how she has essentially taken control of the entire town and its industry as a one-woman powerhouse because, of course, that's what Barbara Stanwyck would do. <laughs> <laughs> but we also see how the killing of her aunt in the opening prologue has allowed her to attain all of this power and control, and she seized it vividly. She also has in her clutches the other character from the opening, Walter O'Neill, played in amazingly his first film performance by Kirk Douglas. So this is the entry of Kirk Douglas into films, and it is a an incredible atypical performance for him as as a as a weaker character who is completely uh, enraptured and. And under the thumb of Martha Ivers. But uh, Walter O'Neill is now the district attorney, a position that Ivers has gotten her husband. And he basically drinks himself into a stupor every day for uh, essentially feeling like a complete failure and unable to do anything but follow the lead of his wife, who obviously doesn't really care all that much for him. <laughs> and has had many lovers and other paramours in the, in the years since, uh, essentially asserting her dominance over uh, the character of Walter, his very nervous and uh, wealth-obsessed father, who became the sort of a uh, foster parent figure for the both of them uh, and after the aunt's demise and kind of set up their eventual marriage. But also uh, this gives us the, the basis of these characters now meeting again all these years later and the other two and both Martha and Walter now wondering what Sam will actually be wanting because he was there the night that 
Aunt Ivers was uh, killed off, uh, which we see her actually murdered by Martha in the opening. So that's not a secret. And we know all three characters were there. So it is, of course, then natural for the other two to suspect Sam of potentially having something on his mind in the realm of blackmail. Of course, this being part and parcel of film noir, uh, it is uh, going to lead us down an ever darkening, spiraling path of uh, all kinds of nasty elements of society and how uh, human interactions can break down so quickly and completely. But it is slightly buoyed by the fact that uh, Sam himself is a decent human being and has no desire or even thought of blackmail whatsoever and is quickly uh, drawn further into the just intricate web of what we quickly realize is the controlling interest of Martha Ivers, who has just a, a, a just a, a hold on the entire town and ability to essentially enforce her will on anyone residing in said town. And of course, again, being Barbara Stanwyck, especially coming after Double Indemnity, she is a force of nature. And it is also remarkable to see Kirk Douglas playing Walter as such a completely pitiable creature of, of a man who's essentially just a, a, a stitched or, or taped. He's, he's like a, a man who has been so completely shattered that uh, it's alcohol that essentially tries to tape all the pieces together and, and barely holds him. Uh, so he is constantly on the verge of I mean, he's really going through a never-ending nervous breakdown, and it's the alcohol that subsumes that. It's the interactions between our, our lead trio of, of performers that are the most fascinating and engaging. We also have the love interest of the film, or at least the, the other primary love interest, and who fulfills the sort of good girl role character, which is so prevalent in noir. If Stanwyck's Martha Ivers is one of the great femme fatales, then it's Elizabeth Scott's Tony Marichek, who is the sort of uh, bright spark spark or hope for the future who is also coming from a darker past and has things she's running away from which is why the uh, Van Heflin character of Sam is immediately drawn to her. This was only Scott's second film and she's quite great in the role and looks fantastic of course and was the longtime girlfriend of Hal Wallace and of course this being produced by Wallace and him trying to constantly build her up into being a star means that she gets a great sort of star focus in the film and her character is spot lighted quite a bit even though unfortunately it's uh, it's an underwritten character and scott does what she can with it but this is also only her second film and there's not enough development there and so for me the the weakest aspect of this film has always been the tony character just not being developed enough i, I think the performance is great but when you have Three such standout lead performances that are fascinating and how they're continually shifting in their interactions. And it's this very strange, uh, perverse at times love triangle that's also not always a love triangle. It's, it's constantly going through uh, new developments and twists and turns that constantly going back to the Tony character and having her Elizabeth Scott be spotlighted because Hal Wallace is producing the film and footing the bill. It, uh, and also uh, due to the film being produced during a strike meant that Hal Wallace and others actually wound up shooting parts of the film. And Wallace shot a lot of inserts of Scott to put in the picture against Lewis Milestone's wishes that it does feel a little bit forced in and it feels like a distraction because we're, we're, we're just really interested in our lead trio and that's also, I think, been my, uh, my my biggest qualm with the film is that ever since the first time I saw it, it's one of those films where the, the core central idea is, is so good. And every time you watch the film, all the good juicy stuff is saved for the very end. So it's, it's one of those films where it does take a little while to get there. The film is almost two hours long. So it's, it's definitely a bit longer than your typical noir of the period. I think part of that is due to the, obviously having the opening prologue with the main characters as children and the central murder that sets up the story obviously makes it a longer film, but milestone typically did produce films that were 
uh, on average, a little bit longer, uh, even when he was doing uh, programmers or, or he did some films at Warner Brothers, like The Great Edge of Darkness. That's a, a little bit longer than your, your typical Warner's vehicle. So I think part of it is milestone style, but also, you know, having the opening prologue takes up, you know, an, a, a 10 to 15 minutes at least. So, you know, it, it explains why the film's a little longer, but it's also got a different pace to it. And I'm sure that was uh, at least altered a little bit by having a little bit more focus on Scott and having Wallace and others come in and shoot material to then insert into what Milestone had shot and approved. So that does mean you have the controlling hand of, of Wallace's producer here, which you have in all the films he did at Warner Brothers and all the films he ever produced, period. But uh, Wallace was one of the big name Hollywood producers, one of the, the legendary greatest producers of all time, who also was producer as auteur and had a particular style and sensibility and that's always going to be in any film he produced so this is one of those cases where you do have the producer as a creative force a very hands-on force in addition to the director's visions you always have to reconcile that but but for me i've always felt that it just you, you got to wait until the the last reel of this film, especially to get to the really juicy stuff. And of course, the climax between our sort of multifaceted love triangle between the characters played by Van Haflin, uh, Barbara Stanwyck and Kirk Douglas. I think something that really helps in making the film as effective as it is and also circumventing some of that issue that, that I've, I've always kind of felt the score in this film by Miklos Roja is absolutely phenomenal. The score does a lot of heavy lifting in terms of really helping a, a lot of the interconnecting scenes to just have greater weight to them. Uh, it, it really makes the film an incredibly effective experience. This is one of those scores that, again, it does a lot of heavy lifting. Uh, and I think Roja uh, understood that he had to hit certain emotional notes at certain times to always reflect the the again ever shifting nature of the the relationships and dynamics between uh, our our three lead characters in particular, but also highlighting the developing romance between the Van Heflin and Elizabeth Scott characters and how that has its ups and downs. So that also uh, develops and shifts over the course of the film, and of course uh, they're cast in different lights at different times. And so it's the uh, it's Heflin's character who is the really the central character, and he's the catalyst for all the events that go on because of course as soon as he comes into town as in a lot of classical noir that you'll see you have the figure that comes into an environment whether it's a small town or a big city that is the catalyst for events it's merely their presence that causes others to react in in different ways and uh, one reaction after another furthers the plot and and sets us on this this uh, this this downward spiral for for certain characters and you can even look at that as obviously harkening back, especially to the, the classical Western idea of the mysterious stranger or somebody coming into town. So uh, there, there's there's a lot of classical ideas here. But I think that's why, uh, in spite of all the fantastic performances here and uh, the incredible presence of Barbara Stanwyck and Kirk Douglas as well, because this is very atypical for, for him. And while him playing a weaker character is easier to overlook, uh, it's a really remarkable performance particularly for being somebody's first film and also full of nuance and while you see some flashes of of the Kirk Douglas energy that we we think of him for uh, they're also fascinatingly layered in it, it they're when the Walter character has has moments of of anger or frustration that boil over but they quickly subsume back into the uh, just alcoholic haze and and complete depression that has crushed his soul to the point of uh, not wanting to go on anymore. But it, it, it really stays and remains Van Heflin's picture. He is remarkable in this film and is a likable presence. And that's really important for the character of Sam, that, that for the audience to like this character and, and want him to succeed and, and not be uh, consumed in the, the grasp of 
of Martha Ivers' uh, clutches on everyone else, but also to not be destroyed either. So it, it, it gives the audience someone to root for, and it would be a different film overall if the Sam character was out for, for blackmail uh, the, the whole time, essentially. So it's a film with a lot of nice twists and turns. It does have a mystery aspect to it, and it's one of those films where you don't know exactly how the ending is going to turn out, and that makes it a great first watch but it also means that it does still have some elements for repeat viewings, especially when you know how the film is going to turn out and what's going to happen to our characters. It means that on a rewatch, you can actually look more closely at the performances and the nuances of each scene because you know what the, what the character is eventually going to do at the end. You can see how these little tiny moments start to add up over time and you can more clearly see the, the ebbing and flowing of love and hate and all these different relationships. So it's the core love not love triangle between our, our three leads that is what drives this film and and the ebbing and flowing of their personal relationships with one another uh, that makes this film fascinating and that's the unique quality that makes this a great notable noir and why it's been so uh, celebrated and championed and analyzed all these years uh, because uh, it, it is a classic noir but also I think some of that is because it fell into the public domain and it was easy to access despite having all these crappy versions floating around. It was a film that, that a lot of TV stations could air because they didn't have to pay for it. And you could buy any cheap crappy copy or, or you can still to this day see a random YouTube upload because it's public domain. Um, so I think that also always helps a film get uh, uh, more critical discussion when it's very much available because it's in the public domain and it was circulated a lot in, in free versions and copies over the years. The film also has a slightly different visual identity because it's, it's obviously noir but it doesn't always quite feel like noir. It's one of the noirs that is set in a small town and it has some elements of small town life kind of creeping into the visuals. It's still dominated by light and dark shadows uh, representing the uh, character's internal turmoil. But it was shot by Victor Milner, who shot many uh, great iconic films, including several Barbara Stanwyck iconic titles, such as The Lady Eve. But I think fittingly, he, he wound up shooting The Furies for Anthony Mann, which is one of Anthony Mann's masterful uh, psychological westerns. And of course, a major vehicle for Barbara Stanwyck, uh, just giving a towering performance. And once again, <laughs> having having a run in with Judith Anderson that's very memorable in a film, if you if you know the Furies, you know which scene I'm referring to. So I guess it's kind of funny. There's two iconic uh, Barbara Stanwyck films where Judith Anderson does not have a good time, this being the other one. So I think The Strange Love of Martha Ivers has an interesting sort of placement in the careers of everyone involved and some really notable names that uh, definitely elevate it into the noir pantheon and why it's so discussed. I think it is very well directed by Lewis Milestone, even though he had some run-ins with Hal Wallace in particular. But you can also feel Hal Wallace is invested in this. And although he was a producer certainly of the old school of being heavily involved in every aspect and making his opinions known, felt, and followed, uh, you have to also keep in mind that this was the man responsible for many of the greatest successes in the history of Warner Brothers. And without Hal Wallace, you wouldn't have the Maltese Falcon or Casablanca the, exactly the way they are. So he is one of the greatest producers of all time and was a creative genius in, in his own way. So he was an important voice here and then you have several iconic performances by great stars and a, a, an incredible first picture for Kirk Douglas and the success of this film led to eventually him getting other roles such as his incredible turn uh, the next year in the masterpiece Out of the Past which I consider to be the definitive film noir if you had to choose a definitive noir uh, and it's a completely different performance than what you see here and he would really have his star just take off in 1949 with Champion which is another completely different performance but it's fascinating seeing him here his first time out really do something Something out of his comfort zone and Elizabeth Scott is is a really wonderful presence here even though I think her character is underwritten uh, and uh, Miklos Rose's score is incredible uh, but it's it's Van Heflin and especially Barbara Stanwyck being the force of nature she always is that are the 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 two elements that most sear themselves into your mind of what helped to make Martha Ivers a memorable experience and honestly 
I think of the films Hal Wallace produced after he left Warner Brothers, uh, he had uh, you know some successes, but never achieved that same uh, level of iconic film after iconic film after his sort of blow up with Jack Warner and, and leaving Warner's to become an independent producer. Uh, but of his post Warner Brothers films, I think Martha Ivers is definitely one of the strongest films he ever produced, and that's that definitely counts for something. So to now look at the Kino Lorber Blu-ray, this again is from a new 4K scan of a fine grain element. It has been credited as a restoration in some corners, but that's not really true. This is a new 4K scan of what seems to be the best surviving element. I guess the negative is gone. And it's also replicating the same master we saw previously on a release from Imprint in Australia, which is done as part of one of their noir box sets and has some nice extras. So to talk about the picture quality of this release, this is not a restoration restoration at all. And anybody who says this is a restoration doesn't know what the meaning of the word is. This is a preservation scan done in 4K resolution of a fine grain element. However, this element has significant wear throughout. So you need to expect pretty much consistent scratches, marks, lines, and frame wobble in addition to an occasional hair poking in here and there. Uh, there is some fluctuation for sure. And this is one of the noirs that you watch a new transfer of. And if you look at it on an OLED television, upscale to 4k as I did this is going to wreak havoc in terms of the chroma offshoot that is inherent to OLED displays so that was that was obviously not part of this disc release that's just how OLED handles uh, black and white transfers which is really frustrating and it's really not helpful for noir which is all about darkness and shadow so that's a particular technical headache you're going to have with uh, an element like this transferred as is on an OLED display but this is very much an as is presentation it has a lot of damage baked in and you just need to expect that so do not go in thinking this is a 4k restoration because it's not and kino's blurbs being rather on the generic side it'll say you know 4k from a fine grain element on the back and that's that's kind of misleading so do keep in mind this is a preservation scan while i'm sure there was some cleanup and processing done when making this master this is very much as is but compared to the versions we've had of this film this is a godsend because again this film fell into the public domain decades ago and has seen countless horrible transfers of terrible quality and that's what you'll still find floating around and is all over various youtube uploads so before this point and the imprint disc that preceded this all you had was the paramount dvd that was the only official version you could find there was a laser disc release done from a print transfer um, i've just never gotten to look at that but but that's the only other version that exists that's really official. I think there was also an official VHS tape done around that time in the early 90s as well. But they just got subsumed by the massive amount of horrible public domain crappy video hell transfers. And that Paramount DVD went out of print really fast and has been very expensive. I've tried to find a copy for years. So this was really great that we finally got a new scan and Blu-ray release. But again do go in knowing that this is just an as-is scan. It's the best we've ever had. It's encoded well, but it's very much as-is. That's not to say that this is a bad-looking transfer. Again, it's the best you've ever seen this film look, uh, if you've ever seen this film before. And it has moments of great quality, but it's still not original negative. It's coming from a surviving fine green source, and it has a lot of wear built in. So you're going to see moments of really nice clarity, but then there's also moments that are a little soft or moments that seemingly are from a lesser quality source or some dupe material and the transitions are a little noisy. So, you know, it's, it's very much as is. This is a fine grain element. It has moments of really great quality. It is the best presentation we've ever seen of this title, but because of just the condition of the elements and what survives, it pretty much is exactly how the, the fine grain element obviously is, but it is by no means a restoration as some reviews and things have labeled this. So do keep in mind, this is a nice transfer of the surviving element, but it is very much as is. This also carries over into the audio side of things. We have the original mono mix as lossless DTS HDMA 2.0. 
2.0 mono. Uh, it is quite good in places, but it does have a lot of inherent wear. There is some occasional hiss that does creep in a bit louder. There are some points where there does seem to be a slight volume dip and, of course, some very, very light ticks and occasional pops here and there. It's all age-related wear and wear inherent in the element. It's obviously probably coming from the same exact fine grain source. So this is presumably an optical track source. And of course, that means you have to expect some occasional light harshness in the dialogue and some distortion in the loudest passages or when the music really swells, you're going to get some obvious light distortion here and there. But for what it is and considering the age and condition of the element, it, it's better than I expected and it sounds solid. This is easily the best I've ever seen and heard this film uh, in terms of I got to rent the Paramount DVD once years ago and every other version I've ever seen of this has been terrible in terms of the horrible public domain versions. So this is another just as is presentation uh, because they're just having to work from this surviving compromised element. So it has a lot of wear baked in just like the picture and it, you, it makes sense that the audio has uh, source limitations just like the picture does. To talk about the packaging and artwork, we have a lovely usage of original poster artwork, which looks fantastic. This is easily the best looking video cover this film has ever received because all the public domain ones are just crummy. The Laserdisc looked okay and the Paramount DVD looked okay, but it was a Photoshop job, so it's great to have a uh, lovely poster artwork here. Unfortunately, this is not a special edition. It's not anything fancy, so it's just a generic Kino label their usual generic uh, label on the spine, and then their typical style on the back. So you can see we have it touting a 4K scan of the fine grain 35 millimeter negative uh, from Paramount. And notice it says remastered in HD. That's that's usually the giveaway on a Kino disc that you've got a new scan with some light cleanup work done, but obviously it's not a restoration. Uh, we do actually have some supplements, which most Kino discs don't have, so it's always nice when you do have them. Uh, they turn up here in the form of a new commentary and a trailer gallery. The commentary is an excellent one by the always great Alan K. Rohde, who has written many essential film books and biographies, and of course he also talks about a lot about Elizabeth Scott, who he knew personally. Uh, he also talks about Kirk Douglas, who he, who he did meet on occasions and uh, actually recorded an interview with. And I'll mention that interview again in a minute, uh, because that is quite important in regards to this particular release. But it's another of his excellent uh, noir commentaries that uh, you will find on many different releases. He's, of course, done several for Elizabeth Scott films. He has a great one on the indicator Blu-ray of Dead Reckoning from their Columbia Noir Volume 5 set. Uh, it's a, it's a great track filled with information and, of course, a must-listen if you're going to revisit this noir classic. We then have the typical Kino trailer gallery, which is all trailers of varying quality. They're all pretty much upscaled from standard def sources, so they don't look super great, but they're trailers of uh, films Kino have released that are somehow tied to the stars or crew of this film. So you see some Sandwick vehicles, some Kirk Douglas films, some Ben Heflin films, and other things like that, and that's typical of Kino releases. Unfortunately, there is no trailer for Martha Ivers. I don't know if one survives in great quality, but uh, it would have been nice to have a, a trailer for the film. But of course, for any film of the classic era, it's not often that their trailer survives in, in good quality and usually is unfortunately absent from most releases. But uh, this is just your standard uh, Kino gallery of old upscaled trailers of uh, other films by uh, but with connections to cast and crew of this film. Now, uh, the uh, Kirk Douglas interview I alluded to that uh, Rhodey mentions in his commentary more than once is actually found on the imprint release, which preceded uh, this Kino release by by a little bit of time and from the same new Paramount master of this uh, from this new fine grain scan. Uh, now, that imprint release was part of one of their uh, film noir collections, and those are always a little bit pricey because you have to import them from Australia. However, Imprint usually does a really great job of generating some new extras for their releases, and it seems like they were the ones who got uh, Rhodey to make this commentary, but then he also went and recorded this interview with Kirk Douglas, who was very lively and animated, and is, of course, unfortunately no longer with us, so that makes that interview very important, and something that you really want to see after hearing Rhodey mention it in the commentary. However, that interview is not here on the Kino release, it's only on the Imprint disc, which also has uh, Rhodey 
already doing, I believe, another uh, a video essay on Barbara Stanwyck, which is substantial. And then there's another video essay on there that's that's quite substantial as well. So unfortunately, there's a number of extras that total to a substantial running time that are not on this Kino release. They only got the commentary from Rhodey. So that's a real oversight and unfortunate. So that means you do have to track down the imprint release and pay quite a chunk of change because you have to import it, uh, which are nice little box sets that are usually pretty pricey and go out of print quickly. Uh, the upside of the Kino release, though, is unfortunately imprint doesn't have the best encoding in the world. And while I don't own their release of Martha Ivers, I have seen others say that the Kino release is better encoded, which is usually how that goes. The imprint disc that I've seen, and I do have their Noir Volume 2. While they're nicely done, uh, they do kind of get a mix of different sources. Sometimes it's a new scan like Martha Ivers. Sometimes it's a super old master done years and years ago and doesn't look so hot now. Uh, but their disc encoding is not not their strong suit really. So the Kino disc is better encoded and is a better technical presentation of this new master and is far less expensive than importing the out of print uh, imprint Noir Volume 1 set. However, you do lose out on a substantial number of extras. Uh, you just get the commentary from that release. So that's really unfortunate here. I don't know if it was a licensing thing and Kino just couldn't get the rights to those or didn't want to bother with it. But it's it's kind of sad when Brody's commentary mentions the Kirk Douglas interview and you're like, oh, wow. And then it's not on the disc. It's only on the imprint release. So do keep in mind, if you're a big fan of this film or you want to see those supplements, you will have to get the imprint disc for those. But the Kino is a is a better technical presentation from a disc encoding standpoint. So overall, I think this is one of Kino's most important noir releases because this is a film that's been cursed in public domain video hell for decades. And it is at least a new 4K scan from the best surviving elements and is the best you're likely to see this film, unfortunately. Uh, uh, it does have a lot of age-related wear in the element, but that's to be expected from coming from a, a fine-grained source that's the best anybody apparently knows of or has. And this does at least have the excellent uh, Alan K. Rohde commentary. It's just a shame we don't have the other extras and that for such an iconic noir that really deserved a special edition treatment, we didn't really get that here. However, it is very affordable and very inexpensive given that it's a standard Kino release, and this is easily one of the most recommendable Kino discs out there from their vast number of titles because we get a great commentary, and it's a new scan of an absolute noir classic that has seen nothing but atrocious transfers and does finally give us an available, affordable, high quality official release to replace the long out of print and very expensive Paramount DVD from the early 2000s. So those have been my thoughts on the Kino release of The Strange Love of Martha Ivers, one of the iconic noirs and a perfect title for Noir Vember. This is a must add to any noir Blu-ray collection. It's one of the best noir Blu-rays out there in terms of being really the best it can be. The one real downside is that it's not a full-blown special edition for such a big name title, and we don't have all the extras from the imprint release. That means that disc is important for all of its exclusive supplements. So as always, I hope my babblings about the everlasting beauty and allure of classical film noir and classic noirs for noir vember and physical media releases and noirs on blu-ray has been at least somewhat fun and informative please do pick up a copy of the kino blu-ray release if you haven't seen this film in this new scan because this is light years ahead of everything we've had before even if you've got the old paramount dvd this is a giant upgrade especially if you were like me and you were never able to get an affordable copy of the out of print paramount dvd this is a real godsend again it's just a shame that it doesn't have all the extras of the imprint version but at least it's very affordable and has the nice commentary and is a must for any noir shelf so as always, please do keep supporting both uh, studio and boutique labels by buying films on disc to help keep both film noir and film culture alive. And as always, thank you ever so much for watching. Thankfully, I was able to complete this video because my car did not break down in Iverstown, but it did break down shortly thereafter. And uh, Blake Edwards said my driving was horrible.